It's Tuesday, May 3rd, 2011. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, Portal 2. Let's do this. So every year I want to do this, but uh, for some reason, every year something came up like on the weekend. But this year I was in the city. There was nothing going on, so I went to the uh, Sakura Matsuri downtown in the, well, down downtown in Brooklyn at the Botanical Gardens. All right. And it was actually pretty awesome. It was like, you know, in, in the anime, you see the cherry trees, and they're just completely full of their little blossoms all over the place. Yeah, like the one right outside my window? Yep. It was exactly like that. This whole just sea of cherry trees. It was pretty great. Do they actually have cherries to eat? No. Then why? What's the point? Okay, well, some other humans enjoy the aesthetics of things. Yeah, I but can, anyway, I can see I a know, tree outside my window. I don't need to go to see a more different tree. Yeah, kind of like how you you don't need to climb any more mountains because you walked up one mountain once a long time ago. <laughs> I walked up a lot more than one mountain uh, once. Anyway, so what I note that was interesting, I mean, it was a fun time. I very much enjoyed it. It was beautiful. But a lot of people were there. A lot of people. The Botanical Garden raised its prices just for that day. All right. Isn't there a law against that? Uh, I don't know. But it was like $15 to get in, unless you were a member. Okay. I also learned if you're a member, which is like 50 bucks a year, it's free to go in anytime you want. Yeah, that's how most memberships work. Yeah, but for the Botanical Garden, that's actually a pretty damn good deal. I would probably All do All the that. memberships are a good deal. Have you actually looked at any... If the, every museum, pretty much, or any gallery, uh, or yes, any, I have anything. looked at them. The stupid Lincoln Center tries to make me be a member constantly. And how much do they charge? Thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Right, but what do you get for your membership? Not that much. You don't actually. get a ticket to every single show. Uh, I have to pay for those on top of the membership. Oh, really? Because usually when you become a member of something like that, it, it's basically a subscription to the whole season of shows. Now I could subscribe individually to say the symphony, but I can't even afford that. Yeah, well, it's a lot of money. It would be cheaper to get season tickets to the fucking hockey games. <laughs> that's, the, that's the other thing. Sporting season tickets, right? It's always surprising because you're like, okay, hockey. It's a hundred and something dollars a seat, right? Yep. So let's say it's $150 a seat. And how many games are there? I don't even know. Like maybe 50 games. But then when you, you multiply and it's like, well, 50 games times 100 it's like, oh, it's like $5,000 for a season ticket. For every game. Yeah, but yeah. that you, you're getting every goddamn game. It's yeah. like, whoa. And baseball, it's like, all right, 90 games. I'll get $40 seats. That's, oh, $3,600. I can go to every baseball game. If I were idly wealthy ah. and didn't mm. have to work because a lot of games mm. are on weekdays. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I mean, hockey games are great, but nothing's worse than leaving a hockey game at it's like weird because at night with work the next day. Like, the individual ticket seems so expensive, but then when you multiply it, it is a lot of money. It's thousands of dollars, which not many people can afford. But when you consider the fact that that's every game, it's like, huh, that really isn't that bad for every single goddamn game. That time is the factor, not the money. Yeah, and the other, my parents parents used to have hockey season tickets in the olden like the 70s but in those days uh it was a lot cheaper hey my family used to see the red wings at the coliseum <laughs> so anyway uh, something interesting about the uh, matsuri there were a lot of people there in cosplay yeah a lot of people that's but because all the anime new york communities really pushed that no, event. no 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 so so th there's there's different degrees here because on one hand there were people in traditional japanese garb celebrating the holiday were they japanese people most of them were yep some of them weren't but they were in traditional garb then the next gen step removed were the people who were dressed up as anime characters but at least they looked reasonably respectable then there were the people who were dressed up as unrelated anime characters. They were just dressed up as, like, a Pokemon or a Gurren Lagann character. Yeah. And then there were the people cosplaying as things that aren't even Japanese. There was the guy dressed up as a creeper. There was a bunch of people dressed up as characters from Left 4 Dead. They were there in a big group. Yeah. I just found this interesting that all these... that Because anime subculture at conventions is kind of like its own culture, almost independent of the anime... If there's any event 
in New York City that in any way is remotely linked to anime, there's this same group of people that show up to every one of them wearing costumes. I mean, that event is basically an anime convention, right? All the all the you know anime uh, communities in New York, you know, Japan Society constantly has cosplay parties. You know, it's it's basically Japan Society and the New York Anime Festival and Kinokuniya and that related group of entities that really push you know milks. And pushes that culture well, I think and it caters to that more, culture. That there's a critical ma- that you know, conventions exist they, out where they do because people want that all the time. But be in New York, there's just so many people that you pick any random day, and if you put an event anywhere in the bounds of the city. You have critical mass for that event if it is related to a yeah. sort of nerdy, geeky culture. Yeah, you know I mean the same thing happens though at the DC uh, soccer thing, right? All the all the DC area. I didn't say it doesn't. Anime, I just know, my anecdotal evidence is all in New York because that's where I am. But I, I know for a fact that all the DC area, like the, you know the DC. Yeah, you don't have to say, but I wasn't whatever. disagreeing with you. It's not just a New York thing. It's I just, didn't it's say it anywhere. was anywhere. I didn't every, say it was. No, you did. You said in New York specifically. The uh, fact is. Anywhere uh, Scott, there is any event, even remotely related. I said related. in New York because that happened to be the example I happened to have been talking about mm. just now. But anyway, these th- this ha- None basically... None of the words I said excluded other cities. The point is, is this happens everywhere that there is anything even close to an anime convention. It's... I didn't say that wasn't true. I just thought it was interesting because I hadn't run afoul of it I had run now. afoul of it many years ago. When? Where? Just by seeing the internets. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> So you got a news? Oh, it's news time, huh? All right. Well, because you don't seem to care. <laughs> not not so really. <laughs> so you want to talk about Sony pooping? It, they're a terrible company. I mean, what can we say? They've had terrible customer service for the last decade. Well, they've they're, had they're terrible the everything for the last decade. Not everything. Their TVs are actually pretty good. Uh, yeah, but Their you, camcorders you, are really good. Their consumer electronics in general but are that's really a, good. But, but that's the thing is, you know, a Sony camcorder, all right, it's not, you know, the worst thing ever, but it's, you know, it's still, it pushes like memory stick and you can get a better uh, one. Most of the Sony camcorders I've seen don't use memory stick. I don't know. Every Sony camera I've seen has memory stick. Some uh, of them also have SD, but they're still pushing memory stick as far as I can tell. So, if they also support SD, it doesn't But who matter. the hell wants that shit memory stick? We just don't use it. Doesn't it's hurt. still on there. So? So, it's, that does, it makes it, you know, worse than another... See, it's weird. I, I think Sony is a pretty terrible company, but I don't feel the need to pick on them for things that aren't really that big of a deal. I would pick on them for things like including DRM that broke audio mm. CDs back in the day. No, including- it was... That it was not DRM that broke audio CDs. It was audio CDs that that installed root kits. If you ah, put no, no, them no. You in know a what PC, it was? you could argue that they weren't actually technically audio CDs. That's they also true. But it was CDs that were pretending that were claimed to be audio CDs. That if you put them into a computer running Windows, would install a root kit via autoplay. They were on the forefront of broken, failed DRM techniques on almost everything. Well, I mean, that's been the history of Sony for decades. Yeah. Is proprietary formats UMD. Mini, well, mini disc wasn't really proprietary, no, but they pushed this. it. They uh, are when succeeding they, in one important area. Bure, so I learned a recently, completely unsuccessful area. No, they actually. So here's my statistic, but let me finish. The first half of this is that Blu-ray sales are up twenty percent. Yeah. Like they're really growing. The second half is that home movie buying of any kind is down like 40%. So they're an increasing share of a rapidly decreasing market. Yeah, that's pretty much, you know, how I see it too. It's like, you know, friggin' digital movies are eating the, the lunch of physical movie buying. There's no reason to buy a physical movie. I mean, if you got Netflix and they're sending you physical movies, all right. If you got a box set of DVDs of an anime, like you buy Fist of the North Star box set for 30 bucks. All right, that that well, makes sense. Here's the thing: I will right? buy a show on physical media if one, it is cheap. I'm talking like effectively free. Yep. Two, you rip it and get rid of the discs. Now, well, two, if it's something I want to lend to people regularly and/or rewatch a lot. Now, if it's the second case, yeah, I'll just rip it. Lending, yeah, I'll give people the DVDs because that's actually easier. Than and giving them digital files. For most of our friends and most people out there, yeah. At least, yeah, it is. Scott, try Plus to the, give. The try bandwidth. Give. The Scott, bandwidth. Pete, our friend Pete, a... try to send him four gigs right now. I can do that. Yeah, if I had your files, I could, but he, his download is too slow. Yep. And I mean, I could try to give it to him on like a USB stick or an external hard drive, but it's actually the bandwidth no. of giving him, just physically handing him four gigabyte DVDs, especially if it's a box set, is a lot faster. 
Of course, it would probably be even faster just to tell him to download it from the Pirate Bay and seed. That is also true. <laughs> uh, but yeah, physical media is dead, so Blu-ray is pretty much like the last physical media. And, you know, it's like, I guess... The last it- DVD I bought was something that I couldn't get on Netflix and we needed to watch. It's a total recall. And I bought it for a dollar fifty used 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 all right <laughs> uh you could have gotten it from netflix as dvd and ripped it you you just couldn't get that it. that was netflix much streaming. more of a pain in the ass and also you still haven't watched total recall we gotta watch it uh, i've seen total recall like 10 times i've also seen it 10 times but we, the reason we bought it is because a lot of people with us have not watched it the girls we planned, have not seen it we planned to watch it and i you know i could see it again well i invited it's been a long you time. over on sunday to watch it but you were busy i was busy yeah what were we gonna do in something i was doing something yeah. work, working on shit as opposed to watching movies <sighs> i was working on the uh the, the, the but anyway project. we didn't even talk about sony's epic fail right which is that the psn playstation network right was totally hacked, and then they sort of meekly you know as because they couldn't even hold it up they're so shitty they had to just take it down and then even when it was down it got hacked again even though they planned to bring it back up partially like this week never mind the fact that they basically lied about and tried to hide the extent of the outage forever now it's possible they're just incompetent they didn't know the extent uh sony's been incompetent for a long time now many people on the internet are trying to make the argument that you know, oh, well, here, Sony should have done this differently. Here's all these IT practices. They were just violating. They weren't doing the, you know, the obvious they standard probably, security thing. They obviously weren't. Now, the reason that's a stupid argument is that once you uh, go out into the real world and you work for any company, you will learn that no companies follow best practices. That's also true. Fucking nobody. The financials, mm. nobody has security worth a shit. That's true. Except for maybe the government. Even then, not really. The only, stuff, in some, only in some parts. The stuff I personally maintain, I can vouch for the security somewhat, except for the fact that some other people know the root password and the, I don't have any control over that. Yeah, the stuff that I personally maintain, I mean, is secure in all the ways that matter. Well, we, uh, again, but we don't have any, anyone else's data. There's, someone, nobody, there's nobody else to make it secure except for me. So, and the thing is, I know many ways I can make it more secure, and I have mapped them out and plan to do them, but they keep giving me other work to do instead because they don't make it a priority, even though I make it a priority so and i have i do not have time or manpower to implement these things quickly to make it even more secure but once i do it would actually be as secure as it could possibly need to be realistically without yep. being and a I mean, huge look pain at in the ass oh someone steals the database of all our publicly available creative commons shows yeah you can't really hurt gig nights it's kind of uh I more secure than case- most companies <laughs> If you were really good, you could deface our site for like 10 minutes before we fixed it. Yeah, I got backups and shit. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. They're in my house. Are you going to come into my house and steal them? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what do you, you know, I, you can't. I guess someone could try to get past my doorman, break into my apartment, and steal the NAS above my right. desk. But basically, the thing that I said on Twitter that got everyone mad, but I kind of believe it, uh, but half trolling, is that if you bought a PlayStation and you got hacked, you sort of deserve it, right? I mean, not that, you know, you deserve to be hacked uh, straight up. But, yeah, you, you deserve basically some suffering for making a stupid decision of buying a PlayStation 3. Now, what if you're one of the people for whom some number of the exclusive titles on the PlayStation 3 were games you wanted and money wasn't really an object? Then I mean, I bought a fucking Xbox for one game, Street Fighter. Okay, that is that is a true thing, Rim. You are correct in saying that there are some people out there, right, who are not like us, and the games on the PlayStation Three are the games that they prefer. And that I mean, that's fine. I and mean, then they want a PlayStation Three, and maybe they're super movie nerds, and they they don't care about money, and they're willing to buy Blu-ray discs for a lot of money because they need to see movies in HD because they're plus, movie if nerds. You wanted even a though Blu-ray, Blu-ray won't last that very long. If you wanted a Blu-ray. That was the cheapest way to get one for a long time. For a while. Now, here's, here's what I have to say. Most of these PlayStation games these people really like that are exclusive to the PlayStation, right? Yep. These are multiplayer games. These are like single-player JRPGs. So you didn't even need to go on the PlayStation Network. You didn't even have to <laughs> right, to play those games. Ah, uh, but you can't blame the victim. I uh, can kind of blame the victim. Yeah, That's like bl- I'm bl- I'm, what I'm doing is I'm blaming someone who got lung cancer for smoking. Ah, but are they the victim or are they the criminal? And I the also victim? blame the tobacco company more so, but, but I also blame the smoker see, but for in this smoking. Case, 
Sony has a bad reputation for a lot of things, but Sony is not unique among com- similar companies in terms of its security situation. Oh, no, not at There's all. There's no not way you can all. tell me that Microsoft is immune to this sort of thing. Absolutely not. I will not say that in any way, shape, or form. However, but I would argue that Microsoft is probably, because it's primarily a tech company... More and that secure. Is, and that is really its only game yeah. that it probably has a lot more going on. Sony... Especially since Xbox is its most advanced and intelligent division. Sony is a conglomerate. Sony does fucking everything. Sony has multiple wings that are in direct competition with each other. Yeah, it's a pro- it's their problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, on one hand, they can make awesome consumer hardware. On the other hand, they're in bed with the content creators who very specifically do not want there to be awesome consumer hardware. And they ruin it all. If I, if no, I, no, my dream, why do they listen to those people? The content creation industry, because the people look at, go watch. If you want to know why Sony is stupid, the way it is, go watch the video of the bosses of Jap- of the Sony apologizing for this break in, right? It's so Japanese old school guys who, you know, and it's so weird because on the one hand, the Japanese businessmen are all like project X, but on the other hand, they're so they, they, their step is not trackless, right? <laughs> they're, right? They have the they, they do things well played in one way, the Japanese way, and they can't veer from that path. If I could own any company in the world, I would own Sony, right? Because I that ship is so big and so powerful. And if a person with actual vision and understanding of technology was in charge, you could you could freaking destroy. Everybody, if they if Sony started veering off to the trackless step, it would be conquering the entire consumer electronics industry. Panasonic, Apple, Microsoft, everyone would get crushed. A Sony Google alliance would even be scarier because that would take over almost all media. Yeah, no, but but I wouldn't well, do you that. Saw that. That's article, too that's oh, too dangerous. Well, you saw that article a while ago. That is absolutely true. Effectively, the the recording industry. Just talk about music. Google or Sony or almost any major real company could literally buy the entire music industry. Yeah. I was talking about this the other day, and I don't want to go too long on this topic here, but uh, I was talking with a coworker. right? Think about this. There are awesome, if you had tons of money, right, there are awesome things that you could do with that money. But what person who is ultra rich in the history of the world has ever done something crazy awesome, right? Like, like Bill Gates is trying to cure horrible okay, diseases. Okay, that's the perfect example that comes up, right? Yeah. So here's here's a, here's I've looked at that example closely, and I realized what he's doing is really not as awesome as it could be. I could be oh. wrong. I could be stupid. Oh. I could be stupid. My math could be wrong. I don't. Okay. I don't know finance, but let me run this down here, right? So Bill Gates is helping many people, mostly fighting malaria and other diseases in Africa, yes. right? He's actually, if you look closely at it, he's doing it in a slightly clever way, right? Uh, which could be viewed on, you know, a skeptic might say that it's evil, whereas I sort of view it as financially sustainable, right? Where basically the company that provides all the drugs, you know, for the malaria, he bought that company, right? So he basically, right? And then the money that he spends to buy the drugs goes to himself, Right, he's the company that he owns, and then to convince the people to take the drugs that they're not evil, he buys the media companies in Africa and changes the advertising so that people think vaccines are good, right? And but in turn, right, so while he's saving the people, he's also making money, right? But it's if you look at it that way, it's like, oh, it's evil. But on the other hand, it's sustainable, right? It's the money he's spending to to help people goes back in and he can turn it around to help the people again, as opposed to the money dissipating to say some pharmaceutical All company. Right. Right. I looked at this math. Right. What do you think the market cap of Merck or GlaxoSmithKline is? All right. Uh, you're already getting into dangerous territory. I know, but just just guess. All right. I don't even know because I don't. Those those stocks actually don't even register on my radar. All right. Well, it's close to. It's between. They're between like fifty and sixty billion dollars. Right. To buy one of those companies. All right. Right. Uh, Bill. If Bill Gates and Warren Buffett each took half of their net worths and combined them. Right. So basically, they each take half their money. They could buy either Merck or GlaxoSmithKline whole, wholesale. They could just buy the, one of those two companies, and then they could take all the patents of those companies and just release them to the world for free, that would do more good, in my eyes, to help people ar- around the entire world you know, cure diseases than whatever they're doing in Africa. Because suddenly, all of those medicines, the prices of them, uh, Scott, would drop more, to almost question nothing. Question one. 
do they continue to operate those companies to generate further intellectual property? As in, more cures to diseases. They own the company. The company doesn't shut down. It just changes ownership. They well, could continue to operate. how profitable is it? And if they give up all the patents, how much money will the company make? How long will it last? We do know... How does it fund the further research? That is a good question. But we do know this, at the very least. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies, right, are insanely profitable, right? Uh, their profits have been going up year after year, right? Their margins are very, very large. They could eat... First of all, they could get rid of, if not all the patents, many of them, right, to maintain profitability. And likewise, the patents they still hold, they could lower those margins, right, just out of the same. Or they could make it into a nonprofit company and operate at a very close to zero margin, be very slightly profitable to make sure it doesn't fold. And that would still do more good for the entire world by providing cheap medicines of all kinds to everybody than just malaria in Africa. But they don't do that. Nobody thinks of doing something so bold and crazy and awesome that you would put in a manga, right? <laughs> they make the mangas afterwards of something like Project X, so, but you never see a sanctuary become real. I, I'm going to sidestep the whole, you know, you still have to fund the further research and all those things. Yep. And I'm going to tell you a story about the Hunt Brothers. All right. The Hunt Brothers... And then, then let's get on with the show. ...tried to buy... Effectively, all the silver in the world. They tried to buy silver. You can't do that because that's an antitrust. Uh, no, that's not why you can't do that. Okay. So if I try to buy a company outright like that, the price keeps going up as you buy. The it. price goes up, I and know. the cost to buy it goes up at a slope that will approach infinity in many situations. But you don't need to buy the whole company. Uh, no, you need to buy fifty-one percent. Yes. If they if they had to buy a hundred percent. There's no way they couldn't they couldn't do it because Merck the, the the market cap of Merck 100 percent is more money than they have combined. All right, they, they so couldn't buy it you all. You want a hostile takeover? They'd have wanna, to buy 51 percent. You want to buy 51 percent? The price is still gonna go up, skyrocket because the entire world will know exactly what you're trying you to do. You have to do it instantly. That doesn't work. You That's do. not how the stock market works. You gotta you gotta do it. So Scott, <laughs> say there, there's a book, an order book, right? Yeah. And at the top are the prices that are close to the market. And the fir and there's like 100 shares at this price, 1,000 shares at one penny more, 10,000 shares at one penny more, going all the way down to billion-dollar shares. Yeah, you don't want to buy the billion-dollar share. Uh, how do you buy them all at once? If you set up a limit price, you're going to get everything in the book up to that point, and everyone knows what you just did. You have to slowly, you know, get. you don't get the shares all at once. you got to make slow deals over time. You yeah, gotta, and it's public. Gotta, people know what you're doing. No, you have to go and you have to meet the, sh the people who currently own own most of the shares and just buy like all their shares you at can't once. do that you have to buy it never it wouldn't work like hey that guy owns 20 percent. let's go talk to him and get him to hand over the 20 percent on paper and a contract in a room somewhere so that's, that way we can get a big chunk instantly that's not gonna happen yeah well you know anyway everyone has a price so there is and other maybe maybe those guys who already own huge chunks of the company you could convince them right to be good people <laughs> and stop being dicks it could I happen I think a better like way in around an eagle, this, in an eagle style fashion, because you do realize we. Uh, well, that's I'll get just, off, but that's got to get off this topic. We do need to fund further research, and your plan would basically destroy that market. I'm just saying, is that's not. I'm just, you know, that particular example has many flaws, right? But it's just an idea of the kind of thing that nobody does. Nobody does anything like that. Yeah, well, why Nothing doesn't Google just buy all the, the music companies? Industry. They could. Why don't they? Yeah, that's what that I would, said. <laughs> that's another. That's an even better example because there aren't any real gotchas. It's like Google could just buy every record company. Done. Game over. So anyway, to riff on another Japanese company. <laughs> oh, those Nintendo, Japanese, so silly. There's been a lot of announcements lately of you know, rumors and speculation about Project Cafe, otherwise known as Daddy's Second Wii. Now, here's the thing. I want to say that's very short. It's going to be announced at E3. Well, I that's know that. pretty solid. But why do people keep saying Wii 2, right? Because they didn't say GameCube 2. They didn't say Super Nintendo 2. So why are they saying Wii 2? It's obviously going to have a different name. Uh, it's not going to be called Wii 2. Not that many people are calling it Wii 2. And actually I heard people, a lot of people calling it Wii 2. And a lot of people, Google around, there were people calling the game, the, you know, the Wii GameCube 2 before they heard Revolution. Yeah. They're like, before there was a project, that. people would say, yeah, when's GameCube 2 coming out? Now the thing is, if you notice, the or, or people would say Super GameCube. I like Super GameCube. Super I would Wii. I would accept Super Wii. I tweeted that. I would accept Super Wii as an acceptable name, but I would not accept Wii too. Uh, notice Xbox and PlayStation, they just up the numbers, but you know, to maintain the brand. But Nintendo's brand is Nintendo, so they don't need to change they they can change the name of their console. 
right? But the other companies, their brand isn't Microsoft, Sony. Their brand is PlayStation, Xbox, so they can't change the name, right? Well, also notice how, you know, the PlayStation 3 was supposed to be the 10-year console, but I think the Xbox is going to be a 10-year console, too. I don't think anything's changing well, if in the, the, play, if the PlayStation, market. If the PlayStation Network didn't fail, the PlayStation 3 probably is going to last, you know, a total of nine-ish years. Well, I think that the industry... Internally, I would guess that secretly in Microsoft and in Sony, within a couple years, maybe within a year, I think they had originally planned, like when they made the Xbox 360 to PlayStation 3, that a new Xbox would come out around that time, like next year sometime. No, they didn't. Vaguely. I'm pretty sure they expected a normal cycle and that they have continuously, from day one, internally extended the projected lifespan of the Xbox based on the fact that the market is kind of at this plateau. Well, what helped them, really, right, is is the Wii, right? The Wii managed to only last five years, and the reason they have to upgrade it is because they put in weaker hardware. So the lower power of the Wii allowed the other consoles to last longer, and you know, basically the other consoles, because they were so powerful when they came out, they were more powerful than they needed to be, they can still crank out 1080p's just fine today, and 1080p's is still going to be probably just fine two, three years down the road until 3D, if 3D ever happens on TVs in the house, which I don't think it's going to you know, be that big that quickly. Of course, the Wii's strength was its gameplay, not its graphics, and that would have been fine, except that Nintendo gave up on experimenting and didn't do anything cool. Well, that's... Uh, that's I why think the other thing I have so... Most li- of the experimenters, right, it wasn't that nin- so much that Nintendo gave a g- of experimenting, which they did. It was that they blocked out experimenters. Like, where's the Super Meat Boy on the Wii? On oh, Nintendo? Well, look jerks. back in time. So it didn't happen. Look back in time. In, in, and all the experimenters. The, NES, the have- SNES, the GameCube was the end of this. There wasn't. Uh, it wasn't really accessible for the average dude who knew how to code to make games. You can make consoles. Bible games. Bible games. So they would make PC games primarily, or nothing. So on the consoles. It was Nintendo who was really pushing the envelope by making weird-ass games or allow- getting other people to make weird-ass games on their console. And now it's kind of everyone else is... The indie scene is doing what Nintendo used to do, trying different things, doing weird stuff. And Nintendo basically gave up on all that and is trying to capture the... I don't know. I, I hate to use the word casual gamer market, but that's yeah. basically Nintendo's, what they after. But Nintendo's problem is that they're trying to sell you Angry Birds for 50 bucks, right? Yep. That's their problem right that's now. That's why I think the DS and maybe... There are a lot of people who looked maybe, at the 3DS and they saw the 3DS games were 40 bucks and were like, fuck that. Well, Why would Nintendo I pay 40 for bucks for a $2 iPhone I think game. a fundamental reason why the Game Boy Advance and the Game Boy and everything were so popular is that until recently, they were the only game in town. And there port- was nothing else that competed with the Game Boy Because line. you couldn't buy Bejeweled for a dollar on your iPhone. Yeah, and look at all these shitty games like Baby's Fashion and Dogs. <laughs> you, love the, you love that Baby's Fashion. <laughs> and Pets <laughs> and all these shit games that, you know, shit tier is it's the called, only thing it's you can called use to shovelware. describe these games. It's called Shovelware. I, I prefer 4chan's shit tier. It's there's Shovelware. Like, there's God tier and shit tier. Uh-huh. So Chocolate and shit. These awful games... Kid don't sell now because those people don't care where they get their games and they all have smartphones. Yeah, who's going to pay $30 for brain training? When they can pay $1 for brain train. Yeah, whatever it is. And they, they don't even play the game. They don't care. So I think Nintendo's era of handheld gaming, uh, I guess, dominance is over unless you don't count cell phone games. Mm. I think they're they're going to be the dominant force of handheld games that are actually real big games. Now I would right uh, worry actually because they're coming out with the the new PSP, the PSP Next Gen, and the PSP has been you know basically sort of had this steady sort of profitable market that hasn't exploded but hasn't shrunk. The PSP it's, is the best like this, competitor in actual games that Nintendo has ever had. But the PSP next generation, right? Uh, I'm not, you know, I don't have high hopes for it. I'm probably never going to buy one. But it is going to be, like, supposedly PS3 powerful. Like, whoa. Like, it, you know, if you thought the PSP... I mean, the PSP screen, when you first saw it, was whoa no matter what, right? Now it's eh. But... The PSP next generation is probably going to be like, whoa, it's HD, whatever. And yep. if it's gigantic and it's Sony, so don't spend your money on it. We already talked about why you don't give money to Sony. It'll use some new like memory dick that you have to put in. Yeah, who knows what it's going to do. It'll just <laughs> rape your children as soon as you open the box. Well, look at the progression, though. You know, Thinking about that, it used to be Game Boy didn't have any competition, really. 
Game, Game Boy Color, no competition. Game Boy Advance, probably the best console in the history of consoles. Well, DS, I think, is better than Well, the DS GBA. was a direct extension of that, but the DS, while it didn't really have any real competition, it moved in a direction of experimenting as opposed to the Game Boy Advance was the last in a long line of just incremental improvement. Mm. And then suddenly the DS was, oh, we'll do something different and cool, and then Nintendo... That was, you know, that and the GameCube were the last times they experimented. The 3DS doesn't look like it's doing anything cool. Yeah, I think the... At least gameplay-wise. 3D is all it's got, and you know what? It's not that impressive. Yeah, the 3D, uh, you know, has not changed the gameplay in the way that the stylus has. You know, the stylus was huge. The dual screens was huge. The 3D hasn't made nearly the kind of impact that either of those two things has made. Yep, and there's no launch title, so I'm not buying one. You know, I like I wouldn't mind playing Pilot Wings or that Steel Driver submarine yeah, game. But in but retrospect, I I'm not gonna have, pay for them. I shouldn't have bought the DS when it came out. I should have waited until Advance Wars came out for the DS. DS Lite. Yeah. So I'm waiting for the 3DS Lite. And yeah, if they come out with the 3DS Advance Wars, you're gonna be forced to buy one. I would probably still. Well, you know what? I don't think they will. What if it's actually a 3D Advance Wars? You can go up and down and see your guys in 3D. Oh my god! But I'd still <laughs> wait probably <laughs> for the 3DS Lite. Probably. I would, if they, but the moral of if they this, came out I wanna, with that, I, I want to get, get to it. Portal, is that Project Cafe, much like the 3DS, my personal opinion is that Nintendo's got to prove to me why I should buy it, as opposed to the last 20 years of my life where Nintendo didn't have to do anything but take money from me. Now they have to show me something before I give them their money. It's weird. When we started out with Geek Nights, it was all... You know, Nintendo is the win. We don't care what people say. Because back then it PC was. PC gaming is dying. And now it was. PC gaming is the king again. Phone gaming is now existing. Oh, look at look at that era. The GameCube mm. and the DS were on this chart. Like the, the amount of potential in both of those consoles that to this day remains untapped is staggering. Yep. And Nintendo basically decided that they don't care about that rich mine of silver because they found a shit mine. Well, you know, if you mine all the silver, the price just keeps skyrocketing. Actually, no, it goes way <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> So things of the day, because portals are popular lately. I can't imagine why. Yeah, we spent a lot of time in that first half. Someone there. made a Flash game. It's Tetris, you know, regular Tetris with portals. It's actually pretty good. I think you should try it out. I will try it out. I yeah. somehow didn't see this on I, the internet. I'm surprised that you didn't see it, which means that you don't actually know how it works. You're speculating now as to where the portals are used. And when you see, you'll be like, oh. I'm sure they're used on the walls of the Tetris area. They're, they're used. Okay. All um, right. Do you, do you know about uh, Tiffin boxes? Uh, see, it's funny. It must be synchronicity because Emily was telling me about Tiffin boxes well, just the other day. Maybe she was reading the same article on the internet that I was reading. I believe she was. Pra, that would make sense, right? I mean, oh, synchronicity. We both read an article on the internet the same day. <laughs> and we both talked about it separately. Gasp. It must be psychic powers. Not reading the same article and the same, you know. It's Anyway, uh, I, it was weird, actually, because I was biking to work today, and I saw a truck that provide, called Tiffin NYC that provides this service in New York. I was like, whoa, that's coincidence. I want them to deliver me a Tiffin. You can. You can sign up. Uh, so here's the, basically the deal, right? In India, specifically Mumbai, but I'm sure in other places, uh, people want lunch at work. You like lunch at work, right? Ah, it's dude. like best part of the day. Uh, but they don't want to go out and buy lunch because that's expensive. And at the same time, uh, they don't want to eat shitty, you know, fast food or something, right? They want home-cooked food. Now, you could home-cook some food and bring it to work on your own. But then it might get cold and you have to reheat it or whatever, right? So what they have is they have this service uh, where basically these people will go to your house, get the food that somebody cooked for you at your house, and bring it to you at your desk at work. So that is for people who have a chef. Uh, they deliver, right? There are 4,000 4, Dabawalas, which are the name for the delivery people. I'm pretty sure I could just tell my butler to drive the stupid food to my office. The 4,000 Dabawalas deliver 160,000 home-cooked lunches, right? They're cooked by suburban wives, and they deliver them to, or mothers, and they deliver them to the office workers every single day. Right. And the percentage of correctness of delivery is ninety nine point seven nines. 
100% correct delivery. So they almost never fail to deliver, even though most of the delivery people are illiterate and they have some sort of system of marking the uh, delivery tins wow, really? so that they know where they go. Yeah. That's, it. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's it's actually quite fascinating. There's a whole video about it, and there's a description of how to read the uh, the delivery markings and what they mean. Like basically, these people, you know, they take the trains, and then at the train station, they split them up. And sometimes your del- your food might pass through like three or four delivery guys' hands before it gets to the place that it's going. But it shows up at your desk, like guaranteed. And basically, there's a, you know, how do they, why don't you bring your lunch to work? Well, because someone will be like, oh, I guess you can't afford the delivery guys. You know, <sighs> it's that sort of thing. So, but, uh, but actually, what I think is, you know, cool, it's like I don't have anyone at home to cook me food to have it delivered to work. You know, and if I'm going to cook it before I leave work, I might as well just bring it with me and use the microwave at work. But you can buy for actually a ridiculously high price in the United States. The Tiffin boxes so that you could put food in it and bring it to work, which actually is a lot more efficient looking to me than the bento box and uh, holds a lot more food because it's basically a stack of, you know, tins that all stack up and seal all together. So you can have a bunch of different courses that are all completely separate from each other. So you can have like the curry in one tin and rice in another tin and meat and some, uh, you know, what's it called? Um, The potato triangles. Uh why am, I, why am I not remembering this word? So, in the meta moment. <laughs> <laughs> in another tin, right. This weekend is the Nerdnik. We'll be at the Nerdnik do nerding and nicking. It's Central Park on Saturday. Yep, I don't know what kind of games we'll play other than things like Jungle Speed and Spotted and Tag and Football. And... You, you know, games you can play in the wind. UFC. On the grass. Yeah, good. just go to nerdnyc.com. And yep, next weekend is the Nerd NYC board game night. There's also a Nerd Night, which is completely unrelated. We might be at, well, either be at the board game night or we'll be at the Nerd Night doing a presentation. Oh, I gotta really? sort all that out. I didn't know about this. I'm, I'm sorting all that out presently. All right. So stay tuned. We'll post a news update. I know we've been lacking in the news updates because both of us forget to post them. So yep. we're going to start posting the news more often. I also uh, want to remind people about Bar Camp uh, NYC. Yep, Scott's a big part of that. It looks like it's a lot of fun. If you don't know what bar camp is, it's nerdy and about computers. Just go on the internet and you'll find out. You know, foo bar, but yeah, yeah. Uh, we there's still you can still register for it. It's going to be Saturday, May twenty first, and Sunday, May twenty second. But you know what's really rough? This is going to be rough for me because uh, Friday, uh, May twentieth at night. Oh right, you got into Jane McGonigal's game. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be in the New York Public Library. I'm from, really jealous from I seven, really wanted to be a part from of that. seven forty five well from seven PM to six AM. So I'm gonna be in the library for thirteen hours and then at nine AM, well probably immediately after the library, I'm gonna go over to the Microsoft office for bar camp. You're gonna find the future. There's gonna be no sleep till, till Brooklyn. <laughs> well till Queens. Till Queens. Uh, which is gonna be Saturday night, and then I have to go back to Bar Camp Sunday morning. <laughs> the book club book is Foundation, which every nerd should read, and we, being two nerds who have not read it, are rectifying this. As soon as I finish rereading Prince of Nothing, which you should all do. Oh my god, you should all reread The Prince of Nothing. All five books now. The fifth book just came out. And I got it. This is really important. If you were reading The Prince of Nothing and weren't reading the next set of books, because our Scott Backer has a tendency to end every goddamn book on a cliffhanger. He, uh, he is like Urasawa's a Canadian spirit. The fourth book has the worst cliffhanger I've seen since Escaplone. That's why I have yet to read the fourth book. The fourth book ends I knew literally, that. well, I'm sur- sure glad we survived that. Hey, by God, is that Horatio bowing the end. toward us? The end, no epilogue. <laughs> the fifth book <laughs> is not really a cliffhanger. It ends at a point that was good, and I am not going to be chomping at the bit for the next two books. That is why I have waited until now. I'm going to reread the first three to get it all fresh in the mind, to make sure I have a good handle on all the proper nouns, right? And I know who Inri Sejanus is. Yep. And then I'm going to read those second two, right? Because I bought a soft cover of number four, and I'm going to read your hardcover of five so I don't have to buy a hardcover book. That's fine. I hate reading hardcover books. I'll buy the soft cover one when it comes out. And then... The Prince of Nothing. 
once I finish reading all five, we're going to do a Thursday episode that's not book club. Oh, my God, we're going to. And we're going to do Prince of Nothing again. And we're going to do it again when more books come out every time because it's our favorite book. Seriously, this is the the Prince of Nothing, the first book. I mean, it's not not Shakespeare, right? But it's FRC book series number one. So, I mean, come on. Yeah, these are some good books. And reading the last one again, I'm reading and I'm like, oh, right, these books. Oh, Oh, right, Heron Spear. Says Watha. Heron Spear? Oh my god, the Heron Spear. I still don't know what it is. <laughs> They're not supposed to know. No. <laughs> I, I bet I bet it's a spear and it has at least one feather on it from a heron. That's so my the, guess. The whole time I'm Just reading the, the fifth book, Scott is like has anyone been raped yet? And I kept saying no. I didn't ask you if anyone was raped. You yeah. actually went out of your way. You asked to, to, me at one point, you're like, any raped? I did not ask yes, you, you that. Yes, you did. I asked you that after you had already been being like, you know, hey, there's no rapes yet. <laughs> anyway. You specifically went out of your way to talk So, about. yeah, eventually there was raping. Rim has rape on the brain. It happened. I mean, I mean, there's rape right away in book one, so it's not like... <laughs> one of our friends had never heard of Rape Abraham Lincoln, and because we were talking about our Scott Backer, he came up the other day. But anyway... <laughs> I think that's all the meta we got. So Portal Two, Portal Two. We, Good God, this show's gonna be long. Let's keep, you let's keep it long, while. though. You've because... been listening for forty minutes, waiting for Portal. You know what? It's a Portal game. It, if you liked Portal One, you will like Portal Two the same amount. If you hated Portal One, you will fucking hate Portal Two. Who hates Portal One? People with really, really bad spatial conceptual brain powers. All right, now the Portal Two. You know, let, let's compare and contrast with Portal One. All right, right? Portal One, I think, had better puzzles. Uh, yes and no. They were better because they were slightly. They were very well polished. I mean, Portal was one. Well, of they've the, been well polished in both. Portal was one of the most tightly and beautifully and well designed games I've ever seen. The people who Indeed. work at Valve on games like Half-Life and Portal, are probably the only people in the entire game industry who, if I were presented to them, would have almost no criticism for. Yeah. In fact, basically no criticism. That's mm. legitimate. Yeah, I mean, their networking works. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> you you want to play Counter-Strike, guess what? It works. Yeah, but like we do, we do a panel on game theory, and uh, unnamed developers from Blizzard are like, yeah, you guys think about this way more than we do. And then I imagine the Valve people be like, yeah, your math was all wrong, and we actually, you do it this way. Uh, I don't know, but whether they might do it the same way as the Blizzard people by trial and error, but like the Blizzard people, they succeed in getting it right, yep. whether their methods are inductive or deductive. Yep, but they, anyway, I feel like in Portal 1, the puzzles, because the game was new and I didn't know what to expect, the puzzles were more difficult and there were more red herrings. There were more places to throw portals, so sometimes, like, there were a lot of wrong directions you could go in trying to solve something. Mm. Even though the design of the puzzles was such that if you looked around, it was obvious because they did a really good job of highlighting what to look at. Yep. Portal 2 was almost too perfect. I basically didn't think at all throughout the vast majority of the puzzles. Did you do I, the whole co-op? I didn't do the co-op In the yet. co-op, there's a couple places where we had to think, right? Because usually one or the other one of us would figure out the solution and yep. then we would, you know, you'd have to team up to execute it. So it pretty much, it's like one of you, one of you is going to solve it somehow and then you're going to discuss the execution and then do it. But, uh, because but there, there were a couple where we stood around for a while like derp de derp yep. and felt stupid when we figured it out. See, I haven't played the co-op yet so I can't really talk about that but uh, the cop is so important though it's like it's actually i'd say it's more the most important part of the game oh i really want to play the co-op yeah, maybe you i'm should. going to but the puzzles because they were so streamlined there were almost no red herrings and very few places to throw a portal that were completely useless yes i i was listening to the commentary i'm about halfway through the commentary um i'm gonna try to just watch the rest of the commentary on youtube or something yeah. like that because it's sort of annoying to be, have to play the whole game again. But anyway, the one thing in the commentary is like you notice and they talk about it a lot. Is there's this huge balancing act that goes on, right? It's they want to make the they want you the player to learn gradually, which they do a very good job at, right? Very good job of teaching you different concepts in the game one at a time. It's like here's how to use a portal. Here's how to use a cube. Here's how to use a button. Here's how to use a cube and a button and a portal together. Here's yep. how to do a jump. And they teach you the rules of the game very slowly and gradually. It's the good learning curve. Excellent job. They never mess that up, right? Yep. But what they do is they have so much playtesting, apparently, right? And they, they want to make the puzzles such that, right, they get increasingly more difficult right while introducing new elements but they don't want to make them difficult in the wrong way they're going for the super meat boy right where it's 
It's not. They like, don't want like, oh, I didn't realize that was a button. Yeah, exactly. Like there is one puzzle actually uh, where they met, I think is probably you know it's such a tiny thing and it's probably the only puzzle that could be improved mm. uh, visually design wise. Which one is this? There's one where there's a button that you sort of don't see if you don't look in the right area, and it's like you have to jump up and hit a button, and you won't see it because it's like in a corner. Oh, I, I saw that button like right away. <laughs> Yeah, but like some people, like I didn't see it for about 30 seconds. Nah. And some other people didn't see it for like minutes. Well, I see where you're going. I think I agree. So it's like what they, they don't want to make it hard to solve just by being obtuse or, you know, obfuscated. They want to make it hard to solve by solving. But if you don't make it hard to solve by obfuscating, then, and it becomes really hard to make something that is hard, right? And that's my problem. I brute forced every puzzle. Almost every puzzle by not even thinking. Here, here's my process. I go into a room. Mm. I look at all the places I can throw portals that are angled. Yep. And you know that you're going to jump out of those. And then later when there's goop, I also think, do I want to put a portal there or goop there? And you know what? I put goop everywhere I could except the one place where you can put it fucking everywhere and it doesn't matter. Yep. Because that always solved by brute force. If there's any place where an angle thing goes toward a place where I can get goop, I wouldn't even look at what was on the other side. I would just blindly put the goop, throw the portal, jump through it because... Every jump was guaranteed to get me where I wanted to be. Or at least somewhere different that you hadn't been before. That I had to get to to solve it. Unless you've already taken that jump. I could assume that any jump would take me exactly where I needed to go. Right, and what were they going to do? If they would have put in extra angled surfaces that went to places you didn't want to go, then it would basically just be obtuse. Like, you would go somewhere, and then it would be like, oh, derp, there's no reason to go over here. It's just a red herring. And that doesn't make it harder. That just makes it annoying. But at the same time, because there are no red herrings, Pairings, I didn't have to think. As soon as I saw any way to combine a, wh- two elements together, that seems to be the secret. To any two elements, if you can combine them together, is guaranteed to be the solution. So I've got goop and an angled surface. All right, I'll go through the angled surface on a portal, hit the goop, it'll bounce me where I need to go. Yep. A button and a cube. Cube's going on the button. That's right. It just, I, as soon as two elements link up, it just worked. Yep. And too many of the puzzles also, because even if they had multiple steps... They made it really hard to go to the wrong area. So as a result, you would never have to actually figure out the order of the steps. It was always the direct route. You didn't have to do anything tricky. Yeah, it's like you couldn't, you know, there were some puzzles, I think, in Portal 1, maybe a couple of them, where you could actually go to the next room, but you couldn't actually do anything to progress in that room because you hadn't done the previous yep. room. Or like but you in could Portal get all 2, the way to the end... And then realize, oh, I didn't get, I didn't do a cube thing. Right, so but in Portal the Two, there was no way to get to the next area until you had already solved the first part. So they broke it into chunks. So it's like they made the user. It's like if you were trying to make, uh, you know, think about you know making an operating system. You're making a user interface. So you design. You have the best user interface design in the world. So anyone who wants to do something, it's like, oh, I want to burn a CD. Oh, that was easy. I want to visit a website. That was easy. And just everything is so obvious. It's like the best user interface known to man. But then you want to make it challenging. Well, you can't. How do you make it challenging, but also make it good design at the same time? And that is the fundamental thing in Portal: is that you want. How do you make it harder without making it bad design? Now, luckily, you know it sounds like we're scathingly reviewing the game as being too easy. Because it, oh, it was really so easy. fun. It was so fun. Port- Despite, There's not, I want more uh, friggin' chambers so badly. This is a situation of you know. That's the only criticism we have. <laughs> yeah, the game makes you... It's weird because it's like the game makes you feel smart, right? But it's like the fact that they make the portal, you know, the, the puzzles intentionally not hard, it's sort of like, no, you're really not so smart. Well, here, Everyone. Here, here's one final complaint, and this is actually something that... It's weird because in Portal 1, there was more of this, and I remember being frustrated because it was very difficult in some places. Mm. But in Portal 2, they removed it, and I was more frustrated that it was gone. Execution doesn't matter for 99% of the puzzles. That is, that is, well, you have infinite yeah. time. You just sit there like portal, 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 do your thing. Figure, like, figuring it out is 90% of the battle. There are very few times where you had to, like, shoot a portal midair and then change portals after you pop through. And many puzzles, while well, you didn't need to do that, because I'm just, I was, I guess I'm good at FPSs, I skipped 
a number of portal puzzles with just, execution skill just by using execution skill and making a loop mm-hmm. where I'd fall from the sky into a pit yeah. and I'd just do this a bunch and then I'd bounce off of something and fly off across like everything yeah. the co-op actually has a lot of uh, execution oh, good. type puzzles I for example my criticism. for example there's one where one person has to go basically onto this uh, moving platform behind a wall of glass Right, and the other person has to step on buttons uh, to basically play gyromite. And if you fa- oh man, if you fail at the gyromite, spiky death for the other guy. Oh man! So there, you know, and you have to do the timing of the button pressing to save the other guy from gyromite spiky death. So that's just one example of the kind of execution puzzles uh, that exist in co-op. But another example of execution in co-op, a lot of times you have to do something simultaneously with the other guy uh, with timing. And it's like, so you'll, there's a, the game lets you display a timer on the screen that'll count down for both of you at the same time. So it'll be like three, two, one. And then you both hit the buttons and go into your portals and you have to like, do something at the same time to make it work. <laughs> You know, so there, there is a lot of that sort of uh, Evangelion episode DDR ah, stuff. That's a good episode and a good reference. Yeah. But along these lines, the the portions in between chambers where there's plot going on, like Wheatley's yelling at you or something, were a little too railed. In that they were in definitely Portal railed. 1, once you got behind the scenes, you could, there was really a lot of leeway and a lot of very tricky execution toward the end. Portal 2... Those were actually the easiest parts of the game because just if you see a wide service, you shoot a fucking portal at it. It's almost guaranteed to be the answer. Yeah, because they only had one place that you could actually. Yeah, you couldn't jump on the rails. Or anything. Well, that is that is one thing atmospherically, right? It's like Portal Two had the same kind of humor as Portal One, right? But the addition of the Wheatley character, right, took away and act, while the humor was the same and was you know excellently written and voice acted and executed and all that, right. The in the atmosphere was different because you weren't alone with Glados. Well, right? well, well, well. It was well. much noisier, and in you know, and Only even in some when areas, I would notice. I mean, remember? no, because when Wheatley when Wheatley goes away, Cave Johnson comes in. No, but he's not there that often. He's and there. He's not a lot. interacting. Well, but, all right. I guess at this point we're at the spoiler line. So if you have not yet played Portal Two. Play it, and if you haven't played Portal One, play it. And if you didn't, uh, it's not really. I mean, this is not really. I'm not, I'll warn people because yeah. I'm I'll, I'm going to spoil a few things, and you know I I understand that a spoiler can affect someone's enjoyment of something, even though it's not. Anyway, we're going to spoil shit. So if you haven't played the game, one, what are you doing listening to Geek Nights? Yeah, Portal's yeah. way more fun than Geek. Maybe Nights. they're doing the same at the same time. <gasps> so, we there there was because in in this game there was the Wheatley like part of the game. And the GLaDOS part of the game, the end part of the game, and the Cape Johnson part of the game, and they all had very different atmospheres. Mm -hmm. And I liked that. I liked that the atmosphere was different in all these areas. Yep. Because Portal 1 was really one atmosphere halfway through, and then the back of that atmosphere for the other half. Mm. So I'm glad they did something different, just because it was something different. And I think one of the primary, like, the game itself is really good. But I wouldn't enjoy it nearly as much. I would say a good third of the enjoyment of Portal is just the fact that it is really well written and really immersive and really fucking funny. Uh, you know, it's funny, but it's not that funny. I was laughing out loud during pretty much the entirety of no. the Cave Johnson era. I think ponies are about twice as funny as Portal mm, 2. Uh, when Cave Johnson is just arguing, he's like, yeah, but don't worry, you're not in the control group. Those guys broke all their legs. Uh, I'm being told by the scientists that I shouldn't mm-hmm. have told you that you're not in the control group. What do they know? I pay the like. I, I found that stuff to be hilarious. Yeah, uh, you know, it got me a slight, a slight chuckle. Did you find all the doors, like the secret area with all the extra doors of all the vitrified experiments? I looked around a little bit, but I didn't. I didn't spend the time to actually look in it every single. It was trivial. Single there's one office, granny. right, where there's a door like hidden half behind a bunch of computers, and back there there's a whole bunch of doors, and every door has the audio of you know whatever experiment. Like, turning your blood into peanut oil was back there. Oh, I didn't go back there, no. Oh, really? Yeah. You should have gone back there. You also apparently, we were talking before the show, didn't find the uh, the dry dock to the Borealis. Well, I, no, I didn't either. But yeah. I, I remember the Borealis from Half-Life 2, but I didn't find it in Portal 2. You didn't find the, uh, the, the turrets practicing their song. Well, either. look, the turrets singing, right? I, I found this. I knew that the, in that chamber, there's the, the one turret behind a grating. And I'm like, there's something back there. I know there's something back there. And I try. I was like, poke, 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 poke. Uh, whatever. And See, I basically gave up and kept going. You know how I got back there? Mm. There's a there's You kept a, poking? No, there's a, a laser in that area too, right? Yeah. I angled the laser in and blew up the turret and it blew the grating off. 
Oh, son of a bitch. And then I went in there and then there's the turret I tried singing. to I tried to like poke and look around behind the turret to see if there was a portable surface. No, the other to... part the other Easter egg area was the one place where the containment field's busted. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, I walk through and it's like the containment field is broken and I stop and I'm like And you <gasps> see a portable wall right there and you're like All right, so You're like I'm, I'm going stupid. to get the cube. I didn't notice the portable wall. So you went all the way back got and you're like oh shit, I got to do the puzzle again? No, so I went back and I basically looped and looped and looped to jump over there with the cube. <laughs> you could have just brought the <laughs> and cube. And I did the... all this work. If you would have I... just made a portal before you went down, you could have so just grabbed the cube. So I do this crazy bullshit, like tactical execution <laughs> shenanigan. I get the cube through, and then as I walk in, I see the wall, and I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, if you just you, the thing is you have to make a wall before you jump down. Yep. I almost jumped down without making the portal first, in which case you have to solve the puzzle again. I did that a couple of times later in the game. Yeah, I think my favorite puzzles were the ones involving the goop and the uh, tractor beams. Yeah, the goop, I like that you can put the goop in. Those the tractor are called beams. the the tractor beams are extru are called extrusion funnels. Yep. I actually like the bridges uh, the most, right? Oh, those were fun, especially when you could put them sideways and block turrets. Yeah. Or knock turrets over. I, the thing is, I wish that they would have gotten, like, uh, first of all, did you notice, right, in Portal 1, there were the energy balls? Yep. The energy balls are not present in Portal the, 2. I didn't like the energy balls. What's wrong with the energy ball? Well, they were they were more fiddly. They, they remind me very much of the puzzles you start to get about halfway through Lolo 3. Mm -hmm. Where they'd run out of good ideas, and the puzzle started to rely on fiddly execution of discrete things. Like, there's a thing that's moving around, and you have to also interact with that. Well, I mean, the energy ball is very functionally similar to the laser. But the laser... But it is subtly different from the laser, in that there's just one energy ball, Yeah, right? but the laser, it's by being consistent and being a line, and especially with the, the way you can use the lenses, I think was a more elegant puzzle mechanism. Well, the thing with the laser is that you have to, if you have a laser with a portal, you have to keep the portal open for the laser. Yep. For the energy ball, you can get the energy ball into the into the place it's supposed to go, and then your portals are free again. You don't need to keep putting the energy ball back into its spot. It's there. It's but I guess with the extrusion funnels, I really enjoyed getting goop in places where they probably didn't expect me to get goop. Uh, no, I actually, from what I saw, in you know, is that they they pretty well constructed the levels so that you couldn't really get goop anywhere that would sort of cheat. Uh, I'm sure the YouTube will prove me wrong, but from what I could tell, it was you know pretty tricky to get you know goop somewhere that would really sort of break the level. Yeah, well, when I got to the white goop, because they taught they told you what the other two goops do, and then you get to the white goop, and it's just coming out. I'm looking at him like white goop. I wonder what this does. Yeah. The white goop really sort of, you know, they put it in there because it was clever, but you really can't make any good puzzles with the white goop because basically once you get the white goop somewhere, you can get it everywhere. Nope. And it once depends you can get entirely on the angle of attack from the white goop source. It's if the true. angle is such, then there are many places you but could the thing not is, get goop. When you get the white goop somewhere, you can get it almost everywhere. And if you can get the white goop almost everywhere, Notice then how? you can solve whatever puzzle there is. It Notice how, as a result, there are only a few puzzles with the white goop, and they were actually probably the best puzzles you could make with that the white goop. That was probably all the puzzles you could make with the white goop. That Short just of be having stupid. much larger puzzles. Yeah, I mean, you could use a lot of gratings, because notice goop doesn't stick to a grating, to contain the white goop to certain areas, and then force someone to, like, get the white goop to go through an extrusion funnel to a weird place on a bridge with a late, you know... You know, you could do tricky stuff like that. Yep. But they, they have good puzzles with turning on and off the goop versus the funnels versus other stuff, too. Yeah, I wish, though, that they, they could have made, you know, something more complex, like, you know, the balls hard Super Meat Boy kind of funnels, right? Because Super Meat Boy manages to be balls hard in execution and combination of moves. Right. And the portal too, they get pretty far with combination of moves, but they don't actually go as far as you can get. There's nothing that combines goop and lasers and funnels and bridges simultaneously. Right. No, there's nothing that does all of them at the same time. I think there's one part where you have to put goop on a bridge. And I think that's as complicated as it gets. Right. But it's there's no goop on a bridge with a funnel and both colors of goop and a laser. Well, once you got orange goop, all the puzzles for a while were anytime there's a long stretch, you're just going to run 
into a portal. Well, I like the ones that actually we use orange goop and two portals to pick up speed in yep. a very small area. Yep. Right? Because that, that's pretty tricky. And then those happen more often in the co-op because when you're going through, the when you're picking up speed in a small area with the orange goop, you need somebody else to control the portals to launch you somewhere. You yep. can't do it on your own. Of course, I got through a lot of puzzles by shooting a portal in between the two portals I was gaining up speed on in, like, the half a second you've got. Yeah, I did a lot of that, too, where it wasn't necessary. I would walk through and, like, look and practice until I could snap my view to the exact spot I had to hit from the angle I would see it in through the portal. I would do a lot where you'd shoot a portal, you'd sort of poke halfway through it, and then you would shoot a portal while you're hanging out yep, of the portal. Yeah, and pop out just like you shoot and, then, and pop. And then you pop backwards to end up where you just shot. Yep. That's a, that's always a good trick. <sighs> but, anyway. I don't know, story-wise, it it picked up well. After, like, it, it fit the continuity, except that unless you read that comic, it like there's a huge gap, and the comic is a little too literal of, oh, here's exactly what happened between the two games. Yeah. I don't know. But it integrated. I mean, did you read the comic? Yeah, I did read the comic yeah. in the extras. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the you know the plot is the plot. It's not exactly the most exciting plot. It's just something you know I like to, to carry. Is, I like the end where you're carrying Glados on the potato and the bird. I love how she hates that fucking bird. Yeah, and I just love how Weedley. It, he seems so nice until Glados is kind of like you realize what he is, right? Yeah, and then after that, just. When he's like, oh, God, he's playing classical music. Yeah. But, the, you know, the thing is, the plot really itself is like whatever. You know, the Half-Life 2 plot I care about. The Portal 2 plot I don't care. But it, they intertwine, uh, and they're going to, at least if Half-Life 2 Episode 3 well, ever, ever exists. Well, the Borealis. Exactly. If they, plots ever, if they ever come out with the next game, it, it'll intertwine. But uh, the plot is basically just a vehicle. For, I wonder if Cave Johnson became the G-Man. Maybe, but all of the, you know, the plot is just a vehicle for all the jokes. Right. It's like, you know, the real thing about the story that makes it entertaining is, you know, the potato and, you know, all the, you know, space. But and the only the plot is just something that they can attach all those things onto. Right. The plot itself is, you know, sort of just like a train. But what really matters is the cargo on the train. Yep. The, the end, I thought, was really touching. Like I, the, the ending movie, the whole the only complaint I have about the very end is that the boss fight was a trivial joke. The boss fight was a I trivial just kinda, joke. I walked around. The Portal no 1 boss fight actually was slightly hard. You would die. Yeah. It. it took me like three or four attempts to beat the Portal 1. Portal 2, I literally was like, doop, da derp, da derp. I wish instead of railroading you where basically it lays you where you can't move and then suddenly there's the moon up there, I wish... You would, in the course of the fight, blown up the ceiling and just had to fucking notice the moon and wonder if you could shoot a portal at it. I wish... I, mean, I wish they'd made you figure that out instead of just giving it to you. I wish that they would have had uh, an alternate ending, right? So, you know, by default, you know, it would just be you fight the thing and you smash it and then you get the ending. But... If you were clever and noticed the moon through the ceiling sometime during the fight, you could have gotten the secret ending that way. That ah. would have been that would have been cooler. <laughs> that little bit at the end, while it's the it is the cake is a lie of this game. Space. I actually like space better than the cake is a lie. Space is really funny, especially <laughs> since it was foreshadowed. <laughs> but it's just. I don't know. There's something about it. That little yellow guy who keeps coming by is like when he, the one time I think it's the second time he's like we're in space and and Wheatley's like I know I know yeah. In the commentary they actually talked about how they were originally gonna have uh it wasn't gonna be just Wheatley it was gonna be a whole bunch of different ones but they couldn't find a way to actually introduce all of them to you and make it still stick so they stuck with just Wheatley and some of those some like the cowboy and the space guy those guys were basically originally gonna have much more of a ah. you know they were gonna all these little balls would have had equal footing in the game but they ended up just using Wheatley for the whole game and sticking the rest of them at the That's end. That's fine. Wheatley was pretty that funny. That was definitely a good move. Wheatley was way funnier later when he like in the early part when he's just kind of talking at you it wasn't that funny but afterward and little things like in the beginning when he's like <coughs> you know say something prove you don't have brain damage and, and you, you know, jump it gives you all the cues for like what button to hit and it tells you to hit jump. You yeah know? and he's like all right you jumped you know That's you jumped the, there yeah. yeah that was pretty good I like that. <laughs> But yeah, you gotta play Portal 2. It's one of the best designed games there is, you know, but it's just, the only complaint pretty much is that we're hardcore. And, and it was way not, easy. And it's not challenging enough for our hardcore-ness. At least Half-Life 2, 
you can put it on balls hard mode where like you get killed instantly Thus, by, my by a guy only with a crossbow. Of course, look at Portal 1. It had the challenge chambers. But the thing is about challenge chambers is that those aren't different puzzles. They're just... It's like the puzzles aren't harder. They just want you to solve them very quickly. It's like, I don't want to solve it faster. I want to solve it... I want to solve something that is harder to solve. I want to spend like a good. All right, well, Bionic Commando had that. I did couldn't beat even a fucking quarter of those challenges. Yeah, in Bionic Bionic Commando. Commando. that's a good example. I like those though. Yeah, but uh, I want I want a, like a portal chamber that takes me a good 15, 20 minutes to figure out, but is not hard in an obtuse way, but is hard or, in a super Meat Boy way. I just want more game with. They are coming the out funny. with a DLC that's going to add more portal chambers. So hurrah! Because I did really in, like. I think my favorite environmental part of the game is the huge shift when you find you know the original aperture science and cave johnson in the yeah. 50s and how the comp- all the technology changes like you find the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s yeah and just like all the old infrastructure and how it gives you this impression of this huge area to explore and actually that was some of the most interesting puzzles was just trying to get up through all those ruins yeah the only thing is that, uh, what I was trying to say before, is that the atmosphere of the game, right, is I liked in Portal 1, even though GLaDOS is talking to you, it was a lot more quiet and alone in a Metroid kind of way. Uh, most in Portal of the Kate 2, Johnson part was like that. No, because uh, not uh, no, really. No, you're forgetting. There's, there's the parts where you're going through like a bunch of test chambers. There's also the whole part where you're just in that gigantic area just trying to get up. Well, that very first... Uh, they they talk about that in the commentary how you when the very first time you go down in there and when you you know they try to you know give you that to make you feel but that's just one part you know it's not it's not like you felt that way for the whole game you know? well I don't want to feel the same way the whole game because I felt that in Portal One I wanted a different atmosphere uh, see I, the thing is I like that alone in the dark Metroid kind of action and uh, I'm I'm really disappointed Metroid even got rid of it so see now like, in the uh, Kate Johnson part though the fact that it wasn't a real person talking to you anymore it literally was just recordings you were still completely alone yeah it's true but you didn't feel yeah, you the did. same Metroidness I don't know I, I think you're obsessed with Metroid I don't know, I just I just like it when games you know. It's like, you know, Nintendo had something right. You know, they make Link not talk. And they make, you know, Samus don't not have anyone talk. else with her. That's true. Also, it's also good. I, love, it's a good move. I love the Animal King. Okay. I like how you get to see him at the end. Yeah. I, I love the fact that you see him back there and he is the Animal King. All right. You know, King of the Portals. I know. Yeah. Well, King of the... And, turrets. And, yeah, and the bit where you find the defective turrets and you, re- you swap it out and... Yeah, actually, that part, uh, the first time through, because I did it twice. I, I, I did saved a, pr- a turret before I was supposed to, and That's I carried a, him. It's exactly the first time I did it, I saved the turret, and I thought I had done something clever. And then when I went through and I doing the commentary, and I got to the same part and realized that I would have had to do that no matter what, I was like, oh. I thought I had done a clever different... But I love how every time Wheatley's like, don't look, he's pretty much either doesn't have a solution... Or, or he brute forces it Yeah, stupidly. he just like breaks it. But when he's trying to, quote-unquote, hack the neurotoxin, and he has, there's a lot of dialogue. I waited for a while and just watched him just saying stuff. I don't even know how long it went on. I gave up and just you can go solved and, the puzzle. The thing is, you can just go and get the... I yeah. didn't bother waiting to listen to the dialogue because you can go listen to all the dialogue on YouTube because some people extracted it from the files. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, Portal 2. If you haven't played Portal 1, play that. It was a triumph. If you haven't played Portal 2, play that after... I mean, uh, it's a no-brainer, even at the full price of forty bucks. But if you're cheap, there's no reason not to wait. If you've got someone to do the co-op with later, and you don't care about everybody making jokes about space, and you don't care about yeah, then you know just buy it later when it's inevitably going to be twenty bucks or whatever. I mean, seriously, you might have forgotten, or you might be young. When Portal One came out, it was like one of the greatest, like revolutionary games ever. Yeah, and there's no other game like it, right? You know, we always complain about all these games being genre Portal 1 and Portal well, 2 are, in my opinion, it's its own genre. There's some no- of the greatest games ever made. Do like, you know just- any other FPS puzzle platformers? I don't know any. Well... You could argue that many aspects of Half-Life 1 and 2 are platformers, but not puzzle platformers. Some specific areas were puzzle platformers. Like what? Uh, there's the Half Life Two has a couple physics puzzles. In Half Life One, but, I remember, but they're not room really where you can enter coordinates to blow shit up on the map. Okay. And you have to figure out a sequence of things to blow up while jumping between different areas to get out. Uh huh. 
Yeah. It's not that. That's not exactly a portal puzzle. I didn't say portal puzzle. It it's was not a, a platforming puzzle I, either. There was platforming involved. Yeah, but it's not a platforming puzzle. Uh, I would argue that it kind of was. Uh, anyway, it's not. Anyway, that wasn't the whole game, right? Anyway, and it was still a game by the same people. In the modern era, Valve is probably the most consistently great gaming company there is. Except for Blizzard, but I'm not a, you know, I'm just not a They're fan not my of kind of game, but no. they're consistently great for what they are. So, yep. yeah, you know what? Valve and Blizzard are probably the best gaming companies from actual game design perspectives. Oh, and if you're playing, oh, one last thing while we end the show. If you're playing Portal on a Xbox or a PS3, you suck. <laughs> This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brand OK for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs> <laughs>